Good evening. Welcome to the midweek Bible study here at the Lord's Church in Chesapeake. I don't see any visitors, but if there happens to be one or two around, stick around for a few moments after we finish this evening so we may get to know you a little bit better. We meet again Sunday morning at 9.30 for Bible study, 10.30 for worship services, and again Sunday evenings at 6 for our Sunday evening services. Just a few announcements before we get started. If you have a cell phone or other electronic device, we ask you to turn that off or put it in a silent mode that you, so you do not interrupt services. Also, if you have need of a training room, we got one of those behind the double glass windows here in the main auditorium. And then we have an unattended nursery in the back of the building as well. Uh, just a few announcements before we get started this evening. Uh, prayer list, as always, remains rather lengthy. Rather lengthy. Sister Shannon Shafter will undergo OCD therapeutic treatment for three months, so keep her in your prayers. And Sister Gail Jones, she has terminal cancer, so keep Sister Jones in your prayers as well. 
Also, Sherry is still not feeling well, so appreciate you keeping her in your prayers. And also, Emily Snoke is also at home. This stuff seems to be going around, and once it gets a hold of you, it doesn't want to seem to turn loose. So keep those folks in your prayers. Uh, just a few other announcements. Bi-weekly lads to leaders meeting Friday the 16th at 7 o'clock here at the building. And then the light post. If you've not gotten onto that, uh, check that out and uh, make sure that you can get on. If you can't get on, contact Brene Wine and she'll help you out. Uh, men's fellowship meeting, uh, March the 9th here at 8.30 here at the building. And then ladies' birthday celebration will also be March the 9th from 4 to 6 p.m. We will be led in song. Our first hymn for tonight will be 425, Where Can I Go? We'll be singing one and three stanza. Living below in this so sinful world, hardly a comfort can afford. Straining alone to face temptation, tell me now where could I go but to the Lord? Tell me now where could I go? Where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. Needing a friend to save me in the end. Tell me now where could I go but to the Lord. Life is grand with friends I love so dear. A comfort I get from God's own word. Yet when I face the chilling hands of death, tell me now where could I go but to the Lord? Tell me now where could I go? Oh, where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul, needing a friend to save me in the end. Where could I go but to the Lord? You mark number 12, Amazing Grace, for your invitation song. Good evening, everyone. So when the schedule came out three weeks ago, I was really surprised to see my name on it for tonight. Uh, first time I was up here, I had four months to prepare. The last time I had two months. This time, three weeks, and that's being generous. That's three weeks to today. I had no idea what I was gonna talk about. So what do you do in that situation? Simple answer is, I prayed. So, last week I was on my way to work and uh, listening to this podcast, the Spiritually Armored podcast, by the way, I highly recommend. 
And I'm not sure what was said, but it got me thinking about a sermon that I'd heard by a uh, fellow brother in Christ, Doug Bowen of South Boston Church of Christ, uh, one Sunday while we were visiting with my parents. So I reached out to him and I asked him if it would be all right if I presented it to you tonight. Um, how fitting the sermon was uh, when I remembered it was on the 23rd Psalm. If you'd like, please follow along and turn to the Psalms 23. And don't worry, JJ, I cut the sermon down from 13 pages to three. Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, what is it we like about this psalm so much? If you're like myself and many others, it brings an image of comfort and security. The psalmist writes in Psalms 103, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. The imagery of God's people being a flock of sheep is a familiar one throughout the Bible. But even though it's a biblical image, the idea of we are sheep is not all that flattering. Let me share you some attrib uh, attributes about sheep. First, simply put, sheep are not intellectually, or sheep are intellectually challenged. You've seen trained dogs, tigers, bears, sheep. Have you seen them? No. Sheep also have a very little sense of their whereabouts. If they get lost, there's a good chance you won't see them co uh, coming back again. Unlike the nursery rhyme, Little Bo Peep, that lost sheep is not going to find its way home. In Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, verse 6, Isaiah writes, of all of, a, all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Second, sheep are basically helpless. Sharp claws, they don't have any. Sharp teeth, nope. They're not that fast, nor do they have as much of a, as a growl to scare off predators. Simply put, without a shepherd, they're at the mercy of the lion or thief. Peter writes in 1 Peter 5.8, Your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Also, sheep aren't the cleanest of animals. While other animals can clean themselves, once a sheep gets dirty, it stays dirty until a shepherd steps in, cleans, or shears them. This is exactly how the Bible describes us. As people who, in God's eyes, lose our direction and tend to get lost. As people who are weak and cannot find ourselves. As people who are in desperate need of a good cleaning. Let me share a few traits of our good shepherd. Psalms 23, 4. Comfort. Even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The presence of our shepherd is the source of our comfort. God says in Isaiah 41, verse 13, For I am the Lord your God, who upholds your right hand, who says to you, Do not fear, I will help you. Matthew 28, verse 20, I am with you always, even through the end of the age. He provides, he makes me lay down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. The good shepherd is also alert to the welfare of his flock. He diligently looks over his flock to ensure that everything is all right. Even at night, he sleeps with one eye open and both ears open, ready, to, ready at the least sign of trouble to get up and protect his sheep. John chapter 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd always lays down his life for his sheep. Another thing about sheep, sheep are grazers. If you leave a sheep to themselves, they will continue to eat in the same area until they've turned that area into a complete desert wasteland. They'll gnaw at the grass to the very ground and even destroy the roots. 
they need a shepherd to lead them who will move them from one good one grazing pasture to another good grazing pasture like sheep we too need a shepherd who can lead us beside still waters a shepherd who will guide us in the path of righteousness for his namesake but sadly not everyone in this world wants to be led there are many people who resent any intrusion into their lives they want to find their own way they don't need anyone's help there are many of people but excuse me but there are there's a serious problem when that attitude carries over into the spiritual realm you find a lot of people who have that the attitude i don't need god telling me what to do and what not to do but the truth is we can't do it on our own paul says to his to the romans in his letter to the romans in chapter 3 verse 23 all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of god as long as we are in control we'll make a mess of our lives and the relationships with other people in closing i want to take a look at the fourth word in the 23rd psalm the word my it doesn't say the lord is a shepherd or some shepherd it says he is my shepherd it's this two-letter word that makes the difference my denotes ownership because you see it's possible to know all about Jesus, to even say you believe in Jesus, to go to church twice on Sunday and even on Wednesday night Bible study. Maybe even do things in the, for Jesus, but somehow still never make him yours. You've never made the shepherd your shepherd. Do you remember Jesus' parable, the one that almost gets overlooked because it's in the shadow of the prodigal son? Jesus said in Luke chapter 15, verses 4 through 6, Man, what man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after one which is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lay it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. If you're not in that relationship, you can be. You can be baptized this very evening for the remission of your sins and be added to the flock of the shepherd by the shepherd. If you are part of the flock and need the prayers, please come forward as we stand and sing. That when we 
first believe. Thank you. Let us pray. Dear most gracious, righteous, and heavenly Father, we thank you for the day that you've given us, allowing us to come here this evening, and as well this avenue of prayer. Lord, I pray that the lesson that is presented towards us, pray that we'll take it in our hearts, use it in our day-to-day -day lives, apply it to others as well, Lord. We are thankful for your son Jesus down on the cross for our sins, that we'll have a chance to salvation. Please be with us as we leave this building, Lord and be with us as we go home. In Jesus' most holy name I pray, amen. amen. didn't hear a bell, but I'm sure it rang. 
Happy Valentine's Day to all of you, both men and women. Now, I, I know it's crazy when I see a young man holding a baby. Somebody, don't, somebody didn't beat him over there to grab the baby. <laughs> You're all right, brother. That's all right. All right. Well, it is great to see everyone this afternoon. Uh, we are actually uh, moving along. We're in chapter 13 because we, I had an opportunity to um, go ahead and proceed on with Acts chapter 12 on Sunday. Uh, so let me just kind of a, a, a short brief um, because we had got down to the point where we talked about Herod's death. And you may recall in Acts chapter 12, verse 23, Herod was struck by an angel. Yes, there is a handout coming out. It's the first missionary journey, and we'll hopefully get to that. But one of the things that you'll see on there is that I hope you get a um, handout because there are three possible routes that Paul used. This is a very interesting study. Uh, that I was doing some research on, and it's very interesting because in a lot of places we think of one journey over the mountain where that's not definite, actually confirmed, uh, because there was speculation about the routes that he took. But there are actually three possible routes out there, uh, and I'll tell you which one that they most scholars lean toward. But in um, what we'll see is uh, from Sunday, if you recall, in Acts chapter 12, verse 23, Herod was struck by an angel because he did not give God the glory when the people were shouting at him that he had the voice of a God and not of man. A voice of a God. He didn't bother to correct the people or give God the glory at the time. He sucked it up. He just allowed it all to occur. He took it all in, and he didn't give God any glory, and the Bible tells us that immediately an angel struck him, and he was eaten by worms. And we discuss this because there is a real world um, medical phenomenon where worms get in the intestines, and it does cause serious damage to the point where you can have gangrene in your intestine. And uh, this could have been possibly the problem with him. The Bible says it struck him and immediately he died. And there's we talked about some of the documentation out there. After that, we saw that the word of God grew. Uh, it, it wasn't hindered at all. The word of God grew after this incident. But in fact, verse 24 says the word grew and it multiplied. So there were already churches there. There were already people who were on the fringes when, of course, Herod killed James with the sword and when he arrested Paul and put him in prison. So there was some apprehension more than likely in that area, but... After time had passed and he was struck by that angel and he died, the Bible tells us in verse 24 of Acts chapter 12 that the word of God grew and multiplied. So more disciples were made. More people came to God. From there, chapter 12 ends by letting us know that Barnabas and Paul returned from Jerusalem when they fulfilled their ministry. So, they were in Jerusalem and came back to the church in Antioch. The question is, do any of you remember where Barnabas and Paul were doing this ministry that was mentioned here? Does anybody remember where they were doing their ministry? Come on, boy, if this were a test, we'd be in trouble. Where did they go? Where did Paul and... Barnabas go to. Remember back in Acts chapter 11, verse 27 through 30? Let's go back there and just look now. 11 through thir uh, 27 through 30, the elders of the Antioch church sent Barnabas and Paul to Judea with contributions there after the prophet Agabus. Oh, did, did you, had you already found it? Oh, okay, okay. So, 
Remember, they were sent on a journey to take distribution to Judea after Agabus, the prophet, through the Holy Spirit, had prophesied that there would be a famine. And remember, I gave you a handout that listed all of these other authors who were not biblical people, who identified a major famine that happened during the time of Claudius Caesar, which was during this time frame. Well, they also picked up John, whose surname was Mark, and took them with them. Now, I want you to put on your thinking caps here because we glossed over this in Acts chapter 12, verse 12. Somebody read that for us. Acts 12, 12. So when he had considered this, he you, you got a mic coming for you. The mother of John, and her name was Mark where many was gathered together praying. You got to read it one more time. <laughs> so when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. Amen. All right. So thank you, Brother Manny. Who was this guy, John Mark? Well, the Bible tells us he was Come on, y'all. Help me out here. He was Mary's son. Now, can someone get Mark chapter 6, verse 3, and let's read it. Mark chapter 6. We got Brother Trotter up here. 6, 3. <clears throat> Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon and are not his sisters here with us and they were offended at him okay hmm so here the Bible reveals to us that Jesus brothers did not name a mark a John mark right but there were sisters so that should tell us that Whoever this Mary is that's being referred to as a son, who John Mark is the son of this Mary, is not Mary, Jesus' mother. All right? And that does present a little bit of a conundrum for a lot of folks. It's believed that John Mark was the son of Mary, the wife of Cleophas. Cleophas was mentioned in Luke chapter 24, verse 18. Luke chapter 24 as 18, one of them who saw Jesus on the road to Emmaus. The name is slightly different for Cleophas and any other, uh, but there's three Marys that are always mentioned. Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary, that is the Mary... Um, uh, who is the mother of, well, who's, who's the wife of Cleophas, and then there's Mary Magdalene. So one of those three Marys, and most authors tend to look toward Mary, who is the wife of Cleophas. Okay, so I just want to clear that up because we're now going to see John Mark appear later on now in the scriptures. We're going to see him more often. And we're going to also see that he's going to be traveling with these brothers, but at some point, there's going to become a problem. Uh, yes, Sister Allegra. And there's one more Mary, um, Lazarus' sister Mary. And there's Lazarus' sister Mary. So, absolutely, and thank you, Allegra, because that's a good point. We see Mary's, these, the name Mary, there's several scattered throughout the New Testament. And one of the things that we have to do is make sure we do our homework so we can understand who the Bible is specifically talking about, who they're talking about. It's the same thing we did with James, because one of the James, the James the Apostle, 
was killed by Herod. But there are other James mentioned in the Bible. Okay? So we have to constantly check the facts. We got to be like the Bereans. We got to dig. We got to allow ourselves to take a look at the scripture and see what is being said. Okay? So now, let me go on from here because we're going to now step into a point where we're going to see something going on with Paul and Barnabas when they get back to this church at Antioch. So uh, now let's open our Bibles to chapter 13, and you have a handout, and we only want to read the first three verses. So if someone could read Acts 13, 1 through 3, and we got Cat back there who's going to do a reading. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Mananin, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas, and Saul for the work, whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and they and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Amen. Thank you, my sister. Thank you. So now Paul and Barnabas are now back at Antioch uh, with the church, this church that's here uh, in Antioch. All right, that's been established. The Bible tells us that in this church, there were certain prophets and teachers, certain prophets and teachers. It identifies them. And the Bible shares their names of those that were there. Bible writers suggest that the prophets functioned in the early church as the proclaimers of God's revelation. Teachers explain the meaning of the revelation and help the people apply it to their lives. Okay? So you had the function of the prophets, and then you had the function of the teachers. And we know that Paul, even though he is some often, he was said to have been a prophet, he understands all prophecies, he primarily serves as a teacher, along with Barnabas, that man who is the man of encouragement. That is always called encouragement. And then, of course, you had the prophets. All right. So now, in the text, we see that these men are ministering to the Lord and fasting when the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit spoke to them. All right? So I always <laughs> like to... Uh, put emphasis on that because sometimes in the church of Christ we get afraid to talk about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is an active spirit. It was an active spirit then. It's an active spirit today. But I don't know why in the church sometimes we get a little funny when it comes to talking about the Holy Spirit. No, the Holy Spirit won't talk to us today, maybe like it did back then, because God has given us his whole word. But back then, they did not have the whole revelation. They did not have everything together. So this Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, spoke to these men. Okay? Spoke to them. And the Holy Spirit said, separate from me two people. The Bible tells us that it had a mission for Barnabas and Saul and told the men to separate them so that they could go on it from this church. They were going to leave and go do something else. So they fasted and prayed and they laid their hands on them. Now the question is, was this laying on of hands to convey the Holy Spirit on Paul and Barnabas? Come on now. You guys know this. No. No. Thank you, brother. It was not. That's a natural because we know that when we look back in Acts, and we've talked about it, these men already had the Holy Spirit. 
Okay, so what was the purpose of this laying on of hands? Somebody raise a hand. I'm not going to answer this one. I'm going to stand here and be quiet. What was the purpose of this laying on of hands? Did they mug them? No. Come get a mic. Go the trotter? No, no. Oh, no, okay. He doesn't want to tackle it. Come on, somebody knows. Oh, there's Sister Sin here back there. It's an affirmation, like a confirmation. Affirmation. Confirmation that the Holy Spirit gave this responsibility to these men. Thank you, my sister. That's all it is. It was affirmation that they, if anybody sees them, we now have conferred. We've affirmed that these men were spoken to by the Holy Spirit like all of us. They got the mission. They will handle it. Okay, that's all. Affirmation. Send them on their way. We can do that today. If we had a brother going from here off to a foreign land to do missionary work, and we got together and we prayed for their safety and we all reached out and we laid hands on them and prayed for their safe journey, Pray that they'll do the will of God, Pray that they won't stay, can we lay hands on them? Yeah, we can lay hands on them. The elders have, they can lay hands on someone and bless them, praise them that, and give them, them a mission to do something specific. And you got the role. You got the duty. Nobody else. It's yours. Okay? That's a confirmation, an affirming of what that role or responsibility is. Yes, Sharika? Do you think that we don't do that now because other denominations do similar to, similar like, but they use like oil and put them on your foreheads and stuff like that? Yeah, I, I think that maybe... We, I think sometimes we get afraid to do what we can do because other folks do it. Yes, I do believe that, you know? And it's a shame. It's absolutely a shame that we, through fear of looking like someone else, don't do things that we know we can do. But, you know, that's just one of the things. And that's why you see a difference in some of the churches of Christ. Some people do stuff, some people don't. It's okay. It's whatever they decide to do. That's okay. All right. So now let's go to Acts 13, 4 through 12, and let's have a reader. Let's talk about what happens to Paul as he begins his journey. Paul and Barnabas as they begin this journey. Acts chapter 13, verses 4 through 12. We'll have a reader. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed, they sailed to Cyprus. When they reached Salamis, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they also had John as their helper. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they found a magician, a Jewish false prophet, whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimus and the, the Elimus the magician, or so his name is translated, was opposing them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze on him and said, You who are full of all deceit and fraud, and you son of the devil, you enemy of right, all righteousness, will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and now you will be blind and not see the sun for a time. And immediately a mist and a darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking those who would lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had happened, being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, my brother. Thank you. Again, a lot, a lot to unpack, uh, and we'll, we'll take our time going through it and just take a look at some of the things that are happening here. So this begins Paul's first missionary journey. The Bible tells us that Barnabas and Paul 
And their assistant now, John Mark, left Antioch and went down to uh, Seleucia. So from there, they sailed to Cyprus. I hope everybody can see that. Uh, all right. And when they arrived in Sol uh, Salamis, and that's, I just have it marked as they sailed to Cyprus and go straight to the city, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, which is just a custom of Paul, you know, because they knew that there would be people meeting there, both Jews and proselytes and possibly others now since the word of God has been spread. And in verse 6, they finally come to the island of Paphos. Uh, I had to look this up through the uh, Bible translation, and it's, uh, the word is um, uh, pronounced P-A-A-F-O-W-S, Paphos, Paphos. And this is... Uh, so he comes to this island of Paphos. And here we begin to see an incident is going to unravel. The Bible tells us that when Barnabas, Paul, and John Mark reached Paphos, there was this proconsul there, Sergius Paulus, as, described as an intelligent man who sought to hear the word of God. In history, he's believed to be Lucius Sergio Paulus, or just Paulus, who was the proconsul of all of Cyprus under Claudius in the first century AD. Archaeologists actually discovered a rock with his name on it that was found in a uh, Antioch, uh, the Phocida Antioch, but a second rock was found later in Cyprus at Paphos with a, the similar inscription of his name, verifying that this man actually existed as a proconsul. And also, there was a gate at a harbor as you come in to uh, Paphos, that also had an inscription on part of the brick inlay where he was identified as the proconsul. It's good to be able to check, again, historical markers, to know that during the time of this writing, there was someone from the Roman government that was actually there. As Barnabas and Paul arrived to meet the proconsul, it, the Bible tells us a man attempted to prevent him from talking to the proconsul. And we learn that this man's name was Bar-Jesus in verse 6, or translated Elamus in verse 8. But we also learn that he was a, let me make sure I don't go too fast, a sorcerer and a false prophet. And he's not trying to just stop Barnabas and Paul, but he's trying to stop the word of God from reaching them. I mean, I want you to keep that separated because we're going to talk a little bit about that when I get to the end of this, just to talk a little bit about what was happening here and the outcome. So he was... This sorcerer was trying to stop them, but he's, on the flip side, he's trying to stop the word of God from reaching the proconsul, okay? Uh, in today's application of a situation just like this, you may have run into some Elimaeuses out there, right? Right? where you're trying to teach somebody and someone's trying to hinder you or hinder the person you're talking to from hearing God's word. You're right there. you got someone who is understanding. They're at the cusp of believing. 
And here's somebody in their ear talking to them about something else. Or this can't be true. Or have you ever considered checking out this? Someone trying to hinder God's word from reaching the person that you're proclaiming it to. In this particular situation, the Holy Spirit intervened. Yes, the Holy Spirit intervened. Paul looked at the guy. Have you ever seen somebody give somebody the stink eye? Y'all know what the stink eye is? It said, the Bible says that uh, he, uh, just imagine Paul. He, the Bible says Paul looked at him intently. And then listen to the words, oh full of, oh full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of unrighteousness, will you cease perverting the street, straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is on you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun. If, if, if that ain't a stank eye, I don't know. He put the heebie jeebie on the guy. It was powerful at that moment because here you have the proconsul witnessing an event between Paul and his guy who calls himself a sorcerer and a false prophet. Paul is chastising him in front of the proconsul, a man that the proconsul just met, even though he called him there. He had just met Paul. Elimus is punished because the Bible says that a dark mist fell on him and he was blind. And you know what? Sergius witnessed everything that happened. He believed. His belief in this context means that he was converted. Okay? Anybody not understand that. He was converted. Now I understand that there is, believe it or not, some conflict in the brotherhood about a direct statement such as this, that he was converted purely based on the context of Luke's writing. This is one of those, but the Bible doesn't specifically say. You know, you've heard me say this before. And I'll admit I don't understand the confusion. Okay? Here's the uh, Christian confusion. Or here's why I don't understand the confusion. I believe in these scriptures, Luke presents Sergio Paulus as one of the first Gentile rulers to believe the gospel. The island of Cyprus was a senatorial island, which means it was Roman controlled. As a Roman official, Sergius was a Gentile. Unlike Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 too, that we just talked about, there is no evidence that Sergius attended a temple or was a God-fearer, which Cornelius was a God-fearer. The pagan government official in this particular incident called himself. He called for Barnabas and Saul. He did it himself. He sought to hear the word of God in verse 7. He did. Elamus stood in the way because of Satan. Don't miss it. He stood in the way because of Satan, not so much because he liked his control or position. I submit to you because it was Satan influencing him, just like Satan tried to influence Jesus when he tried to fast and when he was fasting in the wilderness, Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Or in Mark chapter 8.33, when Satan influenced Peter and Jesus had to tell him to what? Get behind me, Satan. 
Or when Satan influenced Peter again and tried to hinder Jesus from doing what? Washing his feet. John chapter 13 verse 9. Or when Satan influenced James and John, the brothers of thunder, because they wanted to destroy a whole Samaritan village because they rejected Jesus. And you know what Jesus said to them in Luke chapter 9, verse 55? Jesus said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. Because Satan had influenced them to stand before Jesus and say, do you want me to destroy the whole Samaritan village? See, that's the power of Satan. He can't make you do anything, but he can influence you when you take your mind off of Jesus and the cross to do things you would not do, you would not normally say. To act in a way that you should not. He can influence your behavior. And that's what we see here. He influenced Elymas. But our man, Sergio, he saw the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, work through Peter and punish this false prophet, this sorcerer. He believed when he saw the power of God in verse 12. He was astonished at the teaching of the Lord, according to verse 12. That teaching came from Peter. Paul, thank you. See if y'all paying attention. All right. That's right. That teaching came from Paul. So, In the whole counsel of God's word, it should not, it should not need to be said that Sergio was baptized when we see the evidence before us that he believed. But just to add one more thing, there are other documents out there. And I found this to be very interesting as I spent some days doing some research. Here's the Strong's, uh, uh, McClinock and Strong's Bible Encyclopedia. They wrote in there, he examined at once, talking about Sergio, once the claims of the gospel and yielded his mind to the evidence of the truth. Here's the uh, royal collection in the United Kingdom that says that Sergio, the proconsul, was converted to Christianity. In a Greek document, From the Institute of Bible Archaeology, they have in their document after Sergius Paulus was converted to Christianity. In this database on other documents, it says that uh, Sergio overcame the attempts of Bargesus to turn the proconsul away from the faith and convert it to Christianity. But there's more. If you like Wikipedia, it says they overcame the attempt. He overcame the attempts of our Jesus and was converted to Christianity. The Easton Bible Dictionary, of course, he was converted. The Smith Dictionary, he was acquainted with the claims of the gospel, yielded his mind to the evidence of the truth. And here's a popular handbook on archaeology. And you notice this language, right? Here is Arabic, because in that book, they say he was converted to Christianity. So, there's no reason not to believe that Sergio became a Christian. And in one document, it's rather interesting because, okay, thank you, uh, it tells you that It's believed that Paul and Barnabas continued on to Antioch and Bethesda because Sergio's family was there. And he wanted them to hear the good news like he did and became, and to see if they would become converts. Now, 
we do recognize as we read the text, as we begin to study, the opposite was true. <laughs> there was a problem in Antioch, and we're going to see that. Okay, so we have to take the whole counsel of God into consideration. Yes, Sarika. I think I know why there could be why there are confusion in, in the brotherhood. I have two reasons. One is because unlike the other conversions in Acts, they mentioned that they were baptized as well as being believed, even though in Sergio's case, they didn't mention him being baptized. Many others were mentioned that they were. And secondly... I don't it, think all of them were, but oh, that's oh, okay. okay. Uh, that's okay. okay. Go ahead. And the second reason is probably because denominations will probably, will probably use that as an excuse to just believe in the Lord and you, that you don't need to be baptized. That's not necessary. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what you'll find is... And, and Sharika, I'm glad you said that, because what we'll find is a lot of people will get hung up on a word and don't do the homework. And so they will take it for what they want to believe. They want to believe. Okay? Yes, sir. Thad. Yes, in Acts 4, verse 4. You Acts find, 4, verse 4. You find after uh, Pentecost, it says, however many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000. So believe does mean that they were converted. Amen. Amen. And so we, thank you, Thad, we've got to make sure we take the opportunity to really look close at the context of how this is being used so that we can understand when someone believed were they, did they take the steps further? Because I'm not sure when we've walked through the whole in Testament, everybody that believed, because we know there were Jews who were part of the synagogue who refused to follow Jesus because they were afraid of being put out. So they would believe, there were Jews who believed but would not take that final step to be converted, to walk with Jesus or be called a Christian. Yes, yes, Barrett. Um, well, two things. <clears throat> mm -hmm. King Agrippa believed. That's right. But was not converted. That's right. But I was gonna Absolutely. I was going to read Acts 19, verses 2 and 3. This is where Paul uh, met these 12 disciples that came from Ephesus. Amen. Okay. And verse Two, he says, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Verse 3, and he said to them, into what then were you baptized? If you believe, you're baptized, at least in the New Testament. That was, a, that was assumed. Now, the exceptions were like King Agrippa. That's and right. The others you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. and, and we recognize that in the instance that Kevin is talking about, they were baptized, but they were baptized under whose baptism? John, right? So they took the steps to be baptized into Christ to receive the Holy Spirit, all right? So we have to stop here, and I appreciate all the comments, all the thoughts, and we'll go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. And we will pick up, Next, with um, his traveling, and we're going to talk about this trip. And you got the handout, so you can take a close look at that, so we could talk about the route that he took. So let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Our Father God, we, we thank you so much for allowing us to be here tonight and to study a portion of your word. We just ask you, Father, that you continue to give us this freedom to do just that where there's no fear of learning about you, no fear of an opportunity to come together as Christians in both fellowship and study so that we can be mindful of your word and grow with it. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity. We pray for those that are sick, that are among us, uh, and those that are shut in. Help us, Father God, to continue to walk as we continue to be part of your family. In your Son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Mm. 
Uh, cut off my piece. Thank <laughs> you. 